Hi everybody, welcome to Sandals Church where we are all about this vision of being real. So no matter where you are or how you heard about us, this is a place for you here. And if you're wondering what does this vision look like in my life, head on over to sandalschurch.tv where you can figure all of that out. Thanks so much for joining us today, I hope you enjoy. Good morning, Sandals Church. Man, it is so good to be back with you guys today. Last week I was in Ireland, hanging out with the Irish. Got some fun stories to tell, and if you're Irish, I feel like I know you a little bit better now. Super glad to be back, though, at Sandals Church, my home, hopefully your home. And we're wrapping up. Can you believe it? We've already gone through the whole book of Galatians. We're wrapping up the book of Galatians today. Our series called Confused, and we're gonna talk about today, uh, Galatians chapter six, why is it that we need church? People have all kinds of ideas about church. You might have ideas about church. Even if you've never been to church, you have ideas. I need church, I love church, I hate church, the church wounded me, the church helped save me. Like we all have these ideas about church. And Paul wraps up his letter to the church in Galatians talking about why I need to be a part of a church. Look, some of you, man, you took a huge step of faith today or you're watching online and you're like, you know what, I, I need to pursue God. I need to connect with God. And so you reached out to Sandals Church, and that's a great first step. But we don't want you just to be a watcher. We want you to become a part of Sandals Church. And that's God's will for your life. He doesn't want you to go on your spiritual journey alone. He wants you literally to be married to his church because the Bible calls the church literally the bride of Christ. Jesus loves the church, died for the church, prays, prayed for the church, and is hopeful for the church. And I don't know what your experience has been, but God has so much more for you than what's happened in the past. So let's take a look at our notes, and, and we're literally just gonna, we're gonna read through the scripture, and we're gonna, we're gonna read through it together, and then I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna go verse by verse, because I want you to be able to unpack everything that Paul has to say about the church. So it begins in Galatians 6. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct, and those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled, you cannot mock God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from their sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. And this is one of my favorite Bible verses. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At the just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those of the family of faith. Let me pray for you today, Sandals. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, for every person that's here. God, I know there, there are people on the verge of giving up. There are people on the verge of giving in. God, life is hard, and some of us are ready to give up hope. Some of us are, are ready to give in, Lord, and just believe what everybody else is believing, God. But I know that so many of us, Lord, are on the verge of blessing. And if we just hang in there, if we just keep trusting if we just keep trudging forward, God, I know there's a blessing for us, Lord. And so help us today, together, Lord, to, to rally together and to encourage one another 
to keep the faith. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to write this down in your notes. I need to be a part of the church because the church is my spiritual family. Paul begins today's message with these words. Dear brothers and sisters, look, this is not a place you attend, but this is a family you're a part of. We love you, I love you. Last week I was in Ireland all week, and I don't, I don't know if, you, uh, if you're a good traveler. I'm not a good traveler. My missionary nickname is Princess. That's just the name that I, I've earned. Like if I ever get a tattoo, that's what it's gonna say, Princess. I don't do well, I don't travel well. I'm allergic to everything. And it was like day six of no sleep. How many of you ever done that where you literally just watching the clock at night? You ever done that? And I had done that, it, it was hot, and I kept trying to, I kept trying to figure out the thermostat, but, it, but in, in, in Europe, they have a different way of keeping temperature, and so I don't understand their system. I was messing with it all night long, and I couldn't get the air conditioning to work, and so I complained at the hotel in the morning, and they said, oh no, we don't have air conditioning in Ireland, it's just a heater that you were messing with. <laughs> God! You ever been far away, you're like, oh, I wanna go on vacation, then you're on vacation, you're like, I just wanna be at home. I just wanna be in my bed. Like the very thing you couldn't wait to get away from, you can't wait to get back to. I'm so just grateful, man, I can control the thermostat. I speak its language. It understands my, my bed, my smells. You have smells, you don't know you do, but you have them. And I got home, I was jet lagged, I was tired. My son said, I wanna to go to church. And my wife said, you wanna go? I said, of course I wanna go. Some of you didn't know this last week, but I was in church, right in the back, watching you. <laughs> Listen to Pastor Adam preach. Man, he had a word of, from, from God for me. He had a word from God for me. Man, I don't know where you are today, but this needs to be home. This needs to be home for you. When I was as far away from God as I could ever be, I was in the United States military serving in the army. And I was invited to church with a friend. I had not been in church in a while, I'll never forget. I walked into church and they were singing an Amazing Grace and I just started weeping because I knew that's where I was supposed to be. The church is your brothers and your sisters and not the knuckleheads you grew up with, right? Not the one that tortured you, punked you, lied to you, stole from you. A new set of brothers and sisters. They're different, do you know why? Ephesians 2, 19, because they're members of God's family. They're members of God's family. You see, the church is the family of God where we learn how to act like children of God. I don't know if you've noticed, but people are jacked, amen? Anybody's family put the word fun in dysfunction? Like, you, you need therapists full time in your house, right? You need, you, need a, you need a reality TV show, that's how jacked your family was. And so the word family gives you a twitch, it triggers you. You're like, I gotta get away from my family. Hey, here's a new kind of family. Listen to me. I don't know if you've noticed, it's not just your family, it's the world. Like in America today, we're talking a lot about racial reconciliation. We're talking about the problems we have in America. And a lot of our problems tend to be white versus non-white. And you think, man, it's, it's just a skin problem. Let me tell you something, racism isn't a skin problem. It's a sin problem. I went to Ireland last week. I don't know if you know this, because some of you haven't traveled. They're all white. Like, they're all white people. The whole island is white people. And there's an occasional guest, a traveler. That I mean, they're so white. Some of you didn't know this. There are shades of white. I saw people so white, they were either a vampire or translucent. There are white people in Ireland that if they went to the beach in California, they would just go, Poof. It's like, wow. And, and if you're white, this is why we have skin cancer. We don't belong here. We belong with the clouds, right, and the rain. The sun is our, not our friend. And I was there, and I couldn't believe it, man. I started picking up on things, because you figure, oh, they're all white, they all love each other, right? No. You see, in Ireland, your last name tells whether or not you're Catholic or Protestant. Well, they're all Christians, so they love each other. No. They hate each other. They've been killing each other for hundreds of years. Can't stand each other. There's Northern Ireland, there's Southern Ireland. There's the Republic of Ireland and there's the Ireland that belongs to the, to the United Kingdom and they're, they're in this conflict. And this famous band in the 80s called U2 sang a song called Sunday, Bloody Sunday. 
And that song has is, is got a cool riff, but it's literally about the violence that took place where literally Northern Irish killed Southern Irish, shot them dead as they were marching for civil rights. And I literally would, would travel through the city of Belfast where it's separated by a wall, like 50 feet tall wall. And on one side you have Catholics, on the other side you have Protestants. And on one side there's a Protestant guy who's killed a bunch of Catholics and he's a hero. And then you go on the other side and he's a terrorist. And then on the Catholic side, there's a bunch of guys that have killed a bunch of Protestants and he's a hero. But on the Protestant side, he's a terrorist. Listen to me, racism is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. We don't need color to hate each other. We have sin in our hearts. And the family of God teaches us how to get along. Like some of you grew up in, in, in homes and the reason you're so tweaked is you feel like your mom and dad should have loved you, should have provided for you, should have cared for you, and they didn't. And you know why? They're sinners. They're self-centered rather than God-centered. They're broken people. And the church is the place where we come and we get fixed. And God heals us through other broken people and the work that he does in our lives. It says, let us not neglect our meeting together. Some people do, but encourage one another. How many of you guys, you're just encouraged too much. Like every day you wake up, people are like, you're special. You're so special. Like you get on the 91 freeway and everybody's like, oh, hey. We didn't know you were here. Like we all need encouragement, right? My son and I, we went surfing. We went surfing and I caught more waves than him because I'm better than him. I've been surfing before he was born. And so I caught a wave and apparently some, some ladies made a sound when I caught the wave. And he didn't want to tell me because he didn't want it to go to my head. But he told his mother, which is good because she needed to hear it. And I caught this wave and apparently this girl goes, woo -hoo! And I didn't hear it because I was shredding. <laughs> but I hear my son tell this story, and he says, the one girl says to the other girl, why did you go woo-hoo-hoo? -hoo? And she said, well, because it was a nice wave. And she goes, and? and apparently, I wasn't there because I was shredding. <laughs> but the one girl said to the other girl, he's kind of hot. <laughs> hey, when you're 48, you will settle for kind of anything. Amen? <laughs> Amen? I told my wife, kind of hot. You need to write that down. We all need a little encouragement, you know? You're kind of loved, right? You're kind of special. You're kind of hot. We all need that. Everybody needs that encouragement. And that's why we come together because you know what? A lot of us at work, we feel like we're failing. In our marriages, we feel like we're failing. Anybody raising kids? Oh, that's fun. I mean, you feel like you're failing as a parent. You feel like you're failing at work. You feel like you're failing at life. My favorite thing to do is to get in a community group with a newlywed couple and they think they're terrible. I'm like, nah, you got nothing. <laughs> Come here, little whippersnapper. <laughs> Let me talk to you about long suffering. <laughs> right? Let us not neglect our meeting together. Let me tell you something. The weekends you don't want to go to church the most is when you need it the most. Did you know there's a spiritual battle? You wake up in the morning. I woke up this morning, I kid you not. You ever had this where you sleep so hard, you wake up in the morning, you don't know who you are or where you are? I woke up this morning, I'm like, why is the alarm going off? What is it that needs to happen today? Who am I? People are like, well, what'd you take before you went to sleep? I'm like, nothing. I just died for a few hours. And sometimes, man, we feel like we don't have time, you know? I don't need church, look, we all need church. We all need to be encouraged. You need to hear, hey man, you're gonna get through this, you're gonna make this, you're gonna survive this, you can do this. That's why those of us who are involved in the marriage mentorship is so important, man. You know our best marriage mentors are the ones who had the most troubles. They had the most troubles. You come in crying, you think you're headed for the divorce, like nah, it's nothing. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but let us encourage one another, especially, circle that word, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is what the Bible says, the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more we need each other. I don't know if you've noticed, but people hate the church and they hate Christianity. 
People are so critical of the church, so critical of Christianity. I literally was reading an article on the way to church today about a 26-year-old missionary who was killed on a remote island just outside of India, and people were mocking him. This young man died. He was shot with arrows just this last year. Do you know why he was on that island? Because he was a Christian missionary who was trying to share the gospel with one of the last known isolated tribes on earth. People made fun of him. That's ridiculous. He's a zealot. He's just like the terrorists who blow up buildings in New York. That's what people were saying. You see, to the world, there's no difference between people that blow up buildings in New York and you and I sharing our faith. What does that say? That's why we need each other. That's why we need to be encouraged. That's why Paul says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Look, you should be a good person, but Paul says, especially to those of the family of faith, because you know how hard it is to be a Christian. Next, my church family can help me on the right path. Look, there's a way that you are supposed to live, and there's the way you actually live, and they're not the same path. See, the world is stupid. They say all roads lead to the same place. Try that on the way home. All religions are the same. Next time you go to the doctors, just say, prescribe me anything. All medications treat the same illness. Right? It's not, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. You need the right medication to treat your specific illness, or it could kill you. It could kill you. If another believer is overcome by sin, you know that can happen? Some of you think there's nothing, there's nothing that could ever separate me from God. I just talked to this weekend one of our licensed ministers I hadn't seen in a while. A licensed minister, somebody who's been prayed over, hands have been laid on. He has been entrusted with the ministry of Christ. He said, I haven't seen you in a while. He said, I haven't been. He said, my marriage is about ready to end. I said, what happened? He said, my wife cheated on me, I cheated on her. You think it can't happen to you? I'm talking to a minister in our church, a licensed minister who's fallen away. If another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. I didn't say, you know you're going to hell, right? I didn't say that. I said, I'm glad you're back. I don't know if I can help fix your marriage. I don't know if we can save that, but I know Christ can save you. I'm glad you're back. You know what he said? He said, I, he said, I can't believe I came this weekend when you preached this message. He said, that's how I know there's a God and that's how I know he loves you. You see, some of you today, you feel like this message is just for you. That's because God died just for you on the cross. He knows right where you are. He knows exactly what you need to hear. And let me tell you something. You can't live for Jesus apart from the church of God. You can't do it. If another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful, circle that word, be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. You see, when someone is drowning and you dive into the water to save them, you can both die. You better be careful. You can be trying to help a problem kid and lose your kids. You can try to help somebody else's marriage and lose your own. Man, do you know that there are people in our church who have been led to faith in Christ by people who no longer go to sandals and have denied their faith in Jesus? Can you imagine that? The person who led you to Christ no longer believes. What happened? They got disconnected from the church. Well, I don't need church. Then you don't know yourself. Do you know why I was in church last weekend? Because I know I need church. I know where I need to be. When I was in Ireland, do you know where I was on Sunday? In church. Do you know why? That's where I need to be. A bunch of my friends, no judgment here, they were going to play golf at a world-class golf resort. Somebody said, well, I'm going to church. And I said, I'm going with you. You know why? I can play golf anytime. I only have so many opportunities to worship the Lord. And I went. I went, music was too loud, the room was too small. The pastor whistled, he's Irish, he whistled when he talked. Think of like Lucky Charms with whistling. 
And you know what? I cried. I cried through the whole message. So good. So good. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Years and years ago, back when pornography was still in magazines, some of you don't know what that is, but back in the day when we used to take the horse and buggy to church, we had pornography in, <laughs> in magazines. And I was discipling this guy and he was struggling and his divorce was ending. And I was counseling him and he had an addiction to porn and, and one day he came in and he put a stack of porn on my desk. He said, I'm done with this! And he put it on my desk. So I had to take a look just to make sure that, you know, <laughs> that if it was indeed pornography. And it was! I went and got my secretary. I said, hey, hey, I need you to get this out of here. And she's like, why? I was like, because it doesn't affect you. Get it out of here. She's like, what do you want me to do with it? I said, burn it. I don't ever want to see it again. Isn't that amazing? In counseling a man not to look at porn, I found myself looking at porn. What happened? We have three things that, that challenge us. Number one, the, you don't have these in your notes, but you can write them down. It's our own sinful desires. Look, I know this is hard for many of you to believe. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had women in our church tell me, you're not a man, you're a pastor. Look, I'm still a man. I still have eyes, and I can still fall and still stumble. Each and every one of us has sinful desires, and I don't know, I don't know what your issue is. It might not have anything to do with your eyes. But listen to me, you know your sin, God knows your sin, oh, and the devil knows your sin. The devil knows your temptation. Some of you have never thought about this. When Jesus fasted for 40 days, he had not eaten. It's why the devil tempted him to turn rocks into bread. And you see some of you singles, it's been too long. You've waited too long. You're ready to give up on your purity. You're ready to give in and just have sex. Right, intimacy is a click away on your phone. And the devil's tempting you because it's been too long and you're hungry. Oh, the devil knows. God hasn't brought a man, has he? Let me suggest one. And he's good looking. We have our own sinful desires. Next, we have our spiritual ignorance. Some of you don't know a thing about the faith you proclaim to believe. And you have no idea. And you literally are led by everything that's said. You've heard me say many times, I can't stand on Netflix. And when you go into religious, they always have these, you know, searching for the real Jesus. Do you know why they're searching for the real Jesus? I've told you this many times, because they don't like the one that came. They're spiritually ignorant. So many churches are selling out and giving in to contemporary culture and cultural pressure. Listen to me, I would rather you be sexually abstinent in this life so that you can inherit the kingdom of God in the next life than preach you a false gospel. If God doesn't care about your sex life, why does he mention it in every single book in the Bible? He cares about what you and I do. Next, some of us, we're under spiritual attack, so we have sinful desires, we have spiritual ignorance, but some of us are under spiritual attack. Look, God has a plan for your life, but so does the devil. Look, some of you parents, you're like, I don't know what got into my kid. What if it is something that got into your kid? Pray over them. Pray over them. And if you can't do it while they're awake, do it while they're asleep, that'll freak them out. Can you imagine they're sleeping, you're just like, Jesus, Jesus. Parents, aren't kids so much better when they're asleep? I mean, you, you forget how beautiful they are, then they're unconscious, and you're like, oh. And then they're awake, and you're like, oh. <laughs> oh. Look, my church, next point, can help me stay, stay real with myself and others. Man, the world believes your BS, don't they? whatever you're into, it doesn't matter how destructive it is. It doesn't matter how destructive it is, we approve it and celebrate it. It doesn't, our world is so upside down. Our world is so broken. Our world gives you bad advice in every area, in every way. Nobody tells you the truth. Nobody tells you there are consequences. 
Nobody tells you in the world that if you change your gender and they cut you with surgery, that for the rest of your life, for the rest of your life, you have to be on hormones that don't belong in your body and you have to be on psychotropic drugs. For the rest of your life, nobody tells you that. And some doctor speaks up and he's banned from medical practice because he told the truth. We don't want the truth. You see, my church can help me stay real with myself and others. Galatians 6, two through three, sharing each other's burdens. I want you to circle that word burden. There are some things you can't carry on your own and you need people to come alongside you who love you and can help you through it. There's a guy in my small group whom I love dearly in his early 30s. I invited him in my small group when I heard the news. He was a newlywed, been married for less than a year, and I found out his wife left him for another man in the first year of his marriage. Broke my heart. I reached out to him, ministered him, tried to disciple him, eventually brought him into my community group. Do you know why? Listen to me, if you're going through a divorce, no one should go through a divorce alone. Ever. After last service, I prayed with an old woman. She said, I've got cancer, and they said, it's in my lungs. Nobody should battle cancer alone. We prayed together. You know what she told me? She said, Pastor, I'm afraid to tell my son because I think it's too much for him. She's dying of cancer, and she's worried about her son. We prayed together. I don't know what you're going through, but if it's too much, God doesn't want you to carry it alone. Even Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, before he was crucified, do you know that he asked his disciples to pray for him and with him? If Jesus needed prayer support, what do you need? Sharing each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. The whole book of Galatians is that we're not under the law. We no longer have to, to religiously follow these 613 commands of, of God in the old Hebrew Bible, but we do have one command, and it's love God and love one another. That's the law. And loving others means we endure difficult stuff. It's why nobody can last in marriage anymore. They think it's all about honeymoons and Instagram. They don't understand that it's actually work. And I hear young people, I wanna have a kid so the kid will love me. I'm like, Poof. <laughs> Look, and it's not that raising kids aren't fun, but it's 99% hell for the 1% heaven. I've spanked my kids on Christmas morning. They were too blessed. I had to bring them back down to earth. <laughs> right? You're just like, what is wrong with you? You're melting. It's Christmas morning. And they're like, nah, I will ruin this as well. You know what love is? Love is loving even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. That's what love is. That's what Christians are called to do because that's how God loved you. Let me tell you how hard it was to love you. Jesus had to die on the cross to love you. Paul says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. We took a boat ride from Belfast to Scotland. And man, it was scary. It was choppy. We were on a little boat. There's about 20 of us. And the guy knew that some of us were pastors, so he told us a story. He said, hey, this is where the song Amazing Grace was written. And I was like, whoa, why? And he's like, well, because this is notoriously treacherous seas and he thought he was gonna die on his ship and he cried out to God that if God would spare him, he would give his life to him. And so he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. And I was like, you suck. Do not <laughs> share that story. And so he encouraged me. He said, well, don't panic because if we, if we capsize, I'll, co I'll call the Coast Guard. And then he laughed. I said, why are you laughing? He said, I am the Coast Guard. So I was on this boat, and I was seriously looking at everybody, and I was like, well, who could I save? And so, you know, I'm like, okay, just some of the little people, because bigger people are gonna have to fend for themselves. Um, I mean, what's the point of us both dying, amen? So we got onto land, and, and this super rich guy behind me that's on the trip, he's like, oh man, thank God, I can't believe we land. He said, I knew the Lord wouldn't kill us because there are a bunch of pastors on board, and he would never kill you guys, so I knew I was good. 
It's like, bro, I am not that important. Okay, and you know what? Neither are you. This is why you guys, you guys all lie. Well, I'm just looking for a ministry at Sandals that use the unique gifts and talents that God's given me. You're not that special. You're not that talented. Listen to me, Captain Importante. Go serve with the two-year-olds. If you survive, Jesus loves you. And if you don't, it was your time. Go change a diaper in the name of the Father, then the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Amen? And if something smells like crap, it's not the diaper, it's you. It's you. Sharing each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone else, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Look, the church is the family of God and what that means is we serve. It doesn't matter what your gifts are. If Tammy says, will you vacuum? I'm not like, that's not like my spiritual gift. I'm a pastor. I'll speak over the carpet, be clean. It doesn't matter what your gifts are. You need to serve your family. You need to get off your butt and serve. That's what you need to do. Galatians 5, 26, let us not become conceited. You see, that's why so many Christians, they wanna tur turn the church into a classroom where they just study principles they never apply. Let me challenge you to do something. So many of you are far more educated then you are obedient when it comes to your faith. Just start serving, start being a part. Let us not become conceited. Why? Because it's so easy. Let us not provoke one another. And let us not be jealous of one another. You see, the church is the last place on earth where people will call you on your crap. Next, my church family provides me with a place to develop my God-given potential. Do you know the reality is most of you have no idea how incredibly gifted you are at helping save souls? You see, some of you waste your whole life trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. I don't, know what, I don't know what career avenue I have. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what you do for a career as long as you bring glory to God and you serve his church. This week in Ireland, I was at this super fancy restaurant, which meant I wasn't paying. <laughs> and I was with this really rich Japanese dude, and he was sharing me his story. He told me his story. In the 1980s, he came to his parents in Japan, and he said, I don't fit here. I don't belong in this country. And if you saw him, I don't know that he fits in America. He's bizarre. He's a bizarre dude, but he's super talented. He's super gifted. We never lost Taro. You could see him a mile away with the clothes he's wearing. He told his mom and dad, he said, I don't fit here. I feel like God's called me to California. His parents were poor and a minority in Japan. Only 1% of Japanese are Christian. He said, I feel like God's calling me to America and we're supposed to start a church as a family. His mom and dad said, well, if God's really into that, he's gonna provide a way. And Tara went as a 15-year-old kid and raised $6,000 and flew his whole family to America. Here's the bizarre part. He lands in Sacramento, California, and he ends up going to the only school in Sacramento with an English as a second language program, my high school. So here's this super rich dude telling me his story, and we were in the same school together. I blew my mind. I didn't think anybody successful came out of my high school. <laughs> and he was like, bro, I can't believe you went to Johnson. He's like, you're white. I'm like, I know. He's like, those guys are crazy. I'm like, I know. He was sharing me with his story. So they came to America, no money, dead broke. They wanted to start a church and reach Japanese people for Christ in California and they had to figure out a way to survive. He said, so they opened a sushi restaurant. Now in the 1980s, nobody ate sushi. Listen to me, white people, you did not like sushi in the 1980s. <laughs> now you're like, oh, I have a little sushi. I'm so sophisticated. Right, okay, in the 80s, white people's idea of ethnic was Taco Bell. Like, that's just how it was. 
Now you all eat sushi. You're like, oh, I'm gonna have some sushi. But nobody ate sushi in the 80s, and so he started this restaurant. And here's what they prayed for. They said, we gotta figure out how to raise $1,000 a month so we can support our church. Listen to me, they didn't start with how can we be rich? They started with how can we support the kingdom of God? Do you know the name of his restaurant? If you go to Sacramento, San Francisco area, it's the largest sushi restaurant chain in Northern California. It's called Makuni's. Now you won't know this, but in Japanese, Makuni's means kingdom of God. Last year, he sold $60 million in sushi and gave $2 million literally to outside sources. That's not even his tithe. That's just what he gave over and above, off the top, to the Lord, and that's why he's in Ireland, because he's there to figure out how he can help plant churches for a bunch of white people who he can't understand. <laughs> Amen? What, what would happen instead of lusting and desiring after everybody else's life? You just said, God, what do you wanna do with my life? What if you said, God, I wanna build your kingdom instead of my kingdom? You see, a lot of you guys are like, well, I'd be faithful if I won the lottery. I literally think there's an angel in heaven whose sole job is to hear dumb prayer requests and they sound like this. God, if you let me win the lottery, if you let me win that 100 million, I'll give you 5 million. And then angel's like, uh, Father, we, we have a, uh, another dumb prayer request. This guy says if you give him 100 million, he'll give you five. And this guy says six. And this guy says six, seven. Do I hear eight? Do I hear it? Nine, 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 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11, 12, 12, 12, 13, 13, 13. Sold to the cheap person who gave 13 million. Here's what I think the Lord's telling you. Why would I bless you with more when you can't be faithful with less? Because you know statistically in America, as we get more money, we are less generous. Less generous. The people who have more are less generous. Why would God want you to be worse? Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. This is one of the first verses that implies we will all stand before the judgment throne of God and you will be held accountable for what you did. God gave you gifts and abilities and he's gonna ask you on judgment day, not how much money did you make, but what did you do with the money you made? Last point, my church family gives me the opportunity to financially support the teaching of God's word. Do you know why I was in Ireland? Because 25 years ago, Ireland was rocked with the priest sexual abuse scandal. Ireland was 99% Catholic, and now they are 99% atheist. In two decades, Ireland went from one of the most Christian religious countries in the world to one of the most highly concentrated areas of atheism because the church that was supposed to protect them wounded them. And now guess what's happening? There's a resurgence. There's a stirring in young Irish hearts. There's a longing for this spiritual emptiness that's now been two decades. And they're not gonna go back to the old church, but they are willing to go back to Jesus. And there's a movement. And that's why I was there, to see how sandals can help, to see what sandals can do. Look, this next passage of scripture is gonna be difficult, but my job is not just to preach the easy passages to you. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to preach all the passages to you. And here's what Paul says. Look, you have a job to do. You're supposed to work. You're supposed to support yourself, and you're supposed to have enough left over to support those who teach you the word of God. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers. That's, that's you. That's you. And let me say, not just to you, now there's more people around the world that watch online for free because of these people in here. And I wanna encourage you, if you're watching online, there's more of you than there are of us, and we need you to give. If you're taught the word of God, and people like to complain, oh, you know what's wrong with America? We took prayer out of school. I'm like, well, we still pray at Sandals. Oh, you know what's wrong with America? Our kids don't study the Bible anymore at school. We study the Bible at Sandals. Maybe instead of complaining, why don't you start contributing? Oh, because I'd rather just rant on Facebook than actually sacrifice. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. All good things. Look, when the Lord blesses you, you're like, well, I worked hard. Well, who gave you the work ethic? 
Well, my parents, well, who gave you your parents? Who gave you your mind, your abilities? Does anybody remember getting in the smart line? The super talented line? Does anybody remember getting in the I want awesome parents who sacrifice for me line? Everything you have, everything you have is because of what God gave you. It's like when my kids were, were little, they would ask me for money so they could buy me something really nice. Dad, I'm gonna get something nice for you this year, so I need you to be generous. <laughs> Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Underline these words, don't be misled, because many of you are. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. Look, you might be a little richer now because you don't tithe, but you're gonna be a lot poorer forever on the other side because you didn't. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always, the Bible says, harvest what you plant. Let me ask you, what are you planting? You see, some of you are planting corn, but you're praying for a different crop. You know what comes up? Whatever you plant. Verse eight, those who lived only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. You gotta choose in this life what you invest in. And you have no idea what Paul is saying here because the English translation is so much softer than what Paul's saying. Paul's saying if you invest in your sexual desires, in your physical desires, in money, wealth, you're gonna inherit a rotting corpse. Years and years ago, Tammy and I, we invested in a property because I was a pastor, and I was like, we're not gonna have any money, so we're gonna try to flip houses. I know nothing about flipping houses. I know nothing about real estate. I'm terrible at both. It was a bad idea, but we, we did it. We bought a house from this woman. She was a hoarder. The house was disgusting. It was awful. The whole time, my biggest fear was, God, please don't let there be a dead body in here. Please don't let there be a dead body. It smelled. It reeked. We worked. We ripped the walls out, the closets out. We did everything. We rebuilt the house, you know, put it on the market to sell, made no money at all. But thank God, you know, we got it out of our hands. We're like, thank God. We sold the house. I'm done. Four days later, the real estate agent calls. Hey, uh, Matt, um, there's something wrong with this house. He's like, I know you sold it, um, and I know it's not your house anymore, but you gotta come over here. There's something dead in this house. And I'm like, oh, I knew it. It's her husband. She killed him and ate his arm. <laughs> so I go over to the house, and sure enough, you know, I, I, let me tell you something. We, we, we have senses. We, have, we can hear, we can see, we can touch, and we can smell, right? Do you know that, that literally biology says that your most powerful sense is your smell? Literally, it makes memories that are cemented in your brain forever. When you've smelled something that's dead, you will never forget it. I walked over to the house. There's this young family. I said, I'm so sorry. I'll put you up in a hotel. We'll find the body. I mean the problem. <laughs> and then we'll deal with it. And here's what happened, man. This woman, I didn't know this. She had 11 cats. And you know where they were living? They were living in the air ducts in the attic. That's why we never found them. So when I tented the house before we sold it, we killed 11 cats. I'm not proud of it. I didn't do it on purpose. Don't send me hate mail. <laughs> so I had to go back to the attic because you can't, you can't find on Yelp, collect dead cats. There's not, there's, not like a, there's not like a search on Google for that, right? So I go up there and it, it smells so bad. I went and bought Vaseline, you know, Vicks Vapor Rub, stuffed it up my nose, didn't help. And, I, and I'm going up there and, and I got all the cats up but there was one cat left and it was stuck in this eve. And so I called this guy in our church, Mike Parcio, because he has no sense of smell. I was like, you're the perfect guy. God has gifted you and empowered you, and I'm gonna use you for the glory of God. <laughs> so it was, it was weird, it was an older house, and we couldn't use a ladder, so I had this idea. I said, I'm gonna get on your shoulders, and I'm gonna pull this dead cat out of the eaves. So I'm on his shoulders, he has no sense of smell, he doesn't know what's going on, and I, I'm trying to yank this dead cat that's swollen and bloated out of the eaves. And if you're a little sensitive, you might not wanna to listen to this next part. So I'm pulling and I'm pulling and I'm on, I'm on his shoulders and I finally just, and I just rip its whole head and spinal cord out of the dead cat. Boom, like this. And there's this dead cat head right next to me. Ah! And there's this spinal cord and maggots, maggots are pouring out. I can still feel them all, all over. And I'm on Mike's shoulders holding a dead cat head. Ah! 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 All he sees, because he can smell nothing, he just sees it's raining maggots. I'll 
I'll never forget it. I'll never, and you now will never forget it. <laughs> Listen, this is what Paul's saying in verse eight. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. In the Greek, it is a rotting, pussing, maggot-filled corpse. Listen to me, what are you gonna do on the day of judgment when you stand before God and what you inherit is maggots? Here you go. You're like, thank you. Can you imagine? You wasted your whole life on stuff and all you get is rotting maggots. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from what? From the Spirit. Doesn't this verse make so much more sense? Many of you, you've heard of this verse, Galatians 6, 9, your whole life. So don't get tired of doing good for in due season. We will reap if we don't give up. You know what happens when you're discouraged? Maggots look appealing. And that's what some of you guys, you're jealous of your neighbor. Well, they got more maggots than me. I don't wanna have maggots. I wanna be filled with maggots. I want maggots all over me. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest an everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I know today there's somebody that's ready to give up. I'm done, I'm done. I've done it God's way and it hasn't worked. I'm gonna do it my way now. What if tomorrow's your blessing day? Listen, some of you know this at Business Sandals. When I proposed to Tammy, my opening line was, are you ready to be poor your entire life? Not a good opening line, but it's the one I chose. This weekend, this weekend, Tammy and I are writing a check to Sandals Church that's more than we made our first year of marriage. And here's why. God blesses you if you don't give up. Don't give up, don't give in, don't sell out. Don't sell out, it's just maggots. It's just maggots. Don't sell out. Don't sell out. Because God listens to the prayers of a Japanese kid who can't speak English. And he says, I wanna build the kingdom of God. So I'm gonna create an entree that white people think is disgusting. And God's like, I'll make them like it. Therefore, last verse, whenever we have an opportunity, we should do good to everyone. You know what he's talking about? Christians should be the most generous people on earth. Wait for it, especially to what? Especially to those in the family of faith. Why did Tammy and I write the, church to San, the check to Sandals Church? This is my family of faith. I wanna be with you guys forever, man. Forever, in this life and the next life. This is Tammy and I's one and only church we wanna serve. I wanna preach till I'm old and you guys are like, good job, but we need you to not talk in the microphone anymore. <laughs> you know what, I'm not gonna leave, I'm gonna be your grandpa. Right, and grandpas are a little weird. You never know what they're gonna say, but you love them, everybody loves them and that's gonna be me. I'm gonna be gassy and we're all gonna pretend <laughs> you didn't smell it. Listen. I wanna encourage you to give today. How many of you guys have bills to pay? Raise your hands. You have bills. Let me give you one bill for Sandals Church this month, one bill. It's our electric bill. Sandals Church electric bill this month is $33,000. Now if you sell solar, I don't want your business card in the offering plate. <laughs> I know you, I know you're like, this is the Lord's will! No. Listen. Sandals is a big church and we got big bills because we have a big family. But this is what we do. If this is your house, you need to pray about giving. God's not gonna bless what you don't give. He only blesses what we give. So let's give today. Let's give today. And I'm gonna pray two things. Number one, that you give. Number two, God blows your socks off with blessings for those who give. And for those of you who give regularly, thank you. There's no Sandals Church without you. We don't exist. We don't exist without your giving. So I'm gonna ask the ushers to prepare for offering and I'm gonna ask for the offering today. 
And uh, I'm super glad that you're here and I love you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and prepare for offering. Lord Jesus, it's such an honor to give to you. I never thought 21 years ago that our church would be this big and that Tammy and I would be able to write a check of this size, Lord, but you've blessed us. And God, I want you to be able to bless everyone in this room the same way. You said in your word, no eye has seen, no mind has thought about the incomparable blessings that you have for those who love you. Lord, and there's so many blessings that are waiting for people in this room, but they're ready to give up or they've never trusted. And so God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would prompt them to do whatever your spirit prompts them to do. And I pray that you would move in their hearts, even those watching online, even if they're far away, move in their hearts for this little ministry in Southern California called Sandals. Lord, bless this offering and bless those who give. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys, God bless. Here at Sandals Church, we really do believe that this vision of being real can change the world. Because Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to creating places for people to be real all over this world. So man, I would love for you to be a part of that and you can make a donation today by clicking the link on this video or going to donate.se. So join us and join what God is doing through this vision of being real and have a great day.